I am always pleased to speak here in our branch meeting in The Hague after giving public lectures and attending public lectures. And this evening I will try to offer a somewhat more intimate addition to what I was speaking about in the public lectures. When seeking knowledge of the world of spirit and attempting to live inwardly with this spiritual world, we must always try to see the hidden side of human existence in the right light. Hidden aspects of human existence are what count, after all, when evaluating and judging human life in general. People who think in superficial, materialistic ways may not readily admit this, and yet it is so. No one can gain insight into human existence without being able to consider its hidden aspects. One might feel like calling the gods to task, if you like, for concealing what is most valuable in human life behind hidden veils rather than offering it to us as an open book. If they did so, however, humankind would remain powerless in a higher sense. Only by first wrestling our way through to true human dignity, by having to work hard to become truly human through our own activity of spirit and soul, can we acquire the soul-spiritual powers that can permeate our whole existence. In this self-conquering, This need to do something ourselves to become human lies what strengthens us and what can fill our inmost being with the necessary powers. In order to explore this overriding theme, I wish today to speak from a certain angle about the hidden side of human existence that is veiled in sleep's loss of consciousness. And I will then tell you of something concealed and unconscious during earthly life that occurs in our pre-earthly life and life after death. Falling into the unconsciousness of sleep after the transitional state of dreaming, a highly dubious kind of existence with a very dubious significance for human life, if one only considers it as it seems to be, we emerge again from this condition when our I and capital and astral body sink down again into our etheric and physical body, thus using these two organizations as a tool to perceive our physical surroundings and working with our will within these surroundings. But what lies beyond birth and death veils itself in the intrinsic human nature that becomes unconscious as we fall asleep. And now I'd like to describe, as if they were conscious, the states a person passes through in this process. We can only become aware of them through faculties of imagination, inspiration and intuition, although all pass through the conditions I will describe. A modern initiate who studies sleep discovers its true nature, but this does not mean his own sleep is different from that of anyone else who enters it quite unconsciously. We can give an accurate account if we describe conditions that remain unconscious, as if we pass through them consciously, and that is what I will now do. After the transition of dreams, as I indicated er already, we pass over into loss of consciousness as far as ordinary awareness is concerned. But the reality of this loss of awareness appears to supersensible perception as if Directly after falling asleep, we enter a kind of blurred state. If we grasped this condition consciously, we would feel ourselves to be poured out, as it were, into an etheric world. We would feel ourselves to be outside our body, not narrowly confined, but poured far abroad. We would perceive our body as an object outside us. If we become aware of this condition, our psyche would be pervaded by a certain anxiety or trepidation. One feels that one has lost the firm support of one's body and is standing before an abyss. Uh, Readers aside, I forgot to mention that this translation is by Matthew Barton. End of readers aside. What we call the threshold of the world of spirit 
has to exist because we first have to prepare ourselves for the sense of having lost the anchor, the purchase which our physical body gives us, and for enduring the anxiety that arises because we face something initially entirely unknown and undefined. This feeling of anxiety, as I said, is not present ordinarily when people sleep. It is not a conscious awareness, but we pass through this state nevertheless. And the way that fear manifests in daily physical existence comes to expression here too, albeit only in subtle processes in our physical body. Certain vascular activities are different in the body when we are afraid than when we are not. In other words, there is an objective occurrence, quite apart from what we experience in our awareness, as agitation and so forth. The objective nature of this soul-spiritual anxiety is something we undergo when we pass through into sleep. But this sense of anxiety is connected with something else, with a feeling of deep yearning for a divine spiritual reality that pervades and imbues the world. If we experienced in full consciousness the first moments, or even perhaps for some the first hours, after we fall asleep, we would initially dwell in this anxiety and yearning for the divine. Any religious mood that we feel during waking life, in fact, originates primarily in our unconscious experience of anxiety and longing that we pass through during the night, which works through into our waking mood. You can say that spiritual experiences are here projected into physical life, filling us with the echo or after-effect of the fear that in general drives us to wish to perceive what is real in the world, filling us too with the echo of the yearning we experience in sleep and express in our religious feelings in waking life. But this is only true of the initial phases of sleep. As sleep progresses, something remarkable occurs. The soul is as if split, fragmented into many souls. If we consciously experienced this state, which only a modern initiate can perceive nowadays in its entirety, we would seem to ourselves to be many souls, and this would make us feel we had lost ourselves. All the separate souls, which are really only shadow images of souls, present themselves as something in which we have lost ourselves. In relation to this phase of sleep, the human being appears differently, depending on whether we consider him prior to or after the mystery of Golgotha. You see, we need the external aid of the cosmos when encountering what I would call fragmentation into many soul reflections. In ancient times, before the mystery of Golgotha, the ancient initiates gave humankind certain religious instruction, doing so via their pupils. The teachers they sent out into the world to help human beings, and such instruction, enacted in rituals, evoked feelings in people's waking life and strengthened their souls. Thus they could take back into sleep something like an echo or after-effect of this religious mood. In the interplay between sleep and waking, therefore, we experience in our yearning for the divine, during the first phase of sleep, something that on awakening inclines us to develop religious feelings. If this religiosity is developed in waking life, on the other hand, as it was in ancient times by initiates, then it works back in turn on the second phase of sleep. Through the echo of this religious mood, the soul then feels itself strong enough to endure its fragmentation and to survive at least amidst such multiplicity. That is the difficulty for non-religious people. They have no such nightly aid to confront their sense of fragmentation into many souls. And 
that they then bear back with them into waking life what they experience there without religious strengthening. Everything we pass through at night, you see, is brought back with us into waking life as an after-effect. Irreligious and anti-religious attitudes do not yet have a very strong tradition in humanity, since they largely originated in the 19th century. So far, people have retained some echo of what they were endowed with in earlier, more honestly religious times. But as an irreligious age continues, this will have significant repercussions. People will bring back with them from sleep the after-effect of this fragmentation of the soul, and this will mean quite particularly that they will no longer possess the cohering powers during their waking life to distribute the effects of their food in the right way through their organism. The consequences of an irreligious outlook will, in not so very distant times, come to expression in significant illnesses. No one should think that the spirit and soul have no relationship with the physical. This relationship is not such that an irreligious attitude will directly meet with retribution in the form of illness, meted out by some kind of demonic divinity. Life does not work in this superficial way. Yet there is an inward connection between what we undergo in soul and spirit and our physical nature. To be healthy during waking life, we need to feel during sleep that we belong to divine spiritual beings in whose activity we immerse the core of our own eternal being between falling asleep and awakening again. Only when we stand within the world of soul and spirit in the right way, during sleep, can we draw forth the right healthy powers of soul and spirit during our waking life. During this second phase of sleep, we enter a state where we possess, instead of our ordinary consciousness, not exactly cosmic consciousness, but a cosmic mode of experience. As stated, only the initiate can become aware of this condition, but everyone experiences it while asleep during the night. And during this second phase of sleep, we enact within us reflections of the planetary movements of our solar system. During the day we experience ourselves within our physical body. In speaking of ourselves as physical beings, we feel that we contain lungs, heart, stomach, brain, and so forth as physical interiority. By contrast, during this second stage of sleep, our spirit-soul interiority is the movement of Venus, of Mercury, the Sun, the moon. We do not carry into us this whole interplay of planetary movements themselves, but instead the reflections, astral replicas of them, which then compose our inner organization. It is not that we are spread out through the whole planetary cosmos, but we are of huge dimensions compared to our physical dimensions in waking life. We do not incorporate the actual movements of Venus into us during sleep, but a reflection or replica of its movements. And between falling asleep and waking up again during the second phase of sleep, planetary movements circulate in astral substance in our spirit and soul. In the same way that stimulated by the motions of our breathing, the blood circulates through our physical organism during the day. In other words, during the night we have a kind of replica of our cosmos circulating in us as our interior life. We first have to pass through a fragmentation of the soul and then we we can experience this replica of planetary circulation. As I have said in ancient times before the mystery of Golgotha, Initiates gave their people instructions for enduring this splitting of the soul, enabling the soul to find its way into these movements which then constituted their inner life. After the mystery of Golgotha, these ancient teachings were replaced 
by what we can acquire as feeling, perception, soul life, and soul mood, by forming a true inner connection with what Christ did for humanity on earth through the mystery of Golgotha. If we feel ourselves strongly enough connected with Christ, to the degree of fulfilling within us the Pauline phrase, quote, not I, but Christ in me, close quote, then through this deep connection with Christ and the mystery of Golgotha, we develop in our sensibility something that works on into sleep. And this gives us the strength to overcome the soul's fragmentation and find our way within the labyrinth of the planetary movements, which have now become our interiority. You see, this is also necessary, to find our bearings, even if we only unconsciously bear these planetary circulations within us as replacement for the blood circulation of waking life, which continues, of course, in the body we have left behind. Having passed through this condition, we enter the third phase of sleep. Here, and what we experienced during the first phase, still remains, while the experiences of the following stage are added, we enter into what I will call an experience of the fixed stars. After experiencing the circulation of planetary replicas, we do actually experience the configuration of the fixed stars, the zodiac, as older eras regarded it, for example. And what we experience here is needed by our soul, because we have to bear this experience of the fixed stars back into our waking life if our soul is to have the power of mastering and enlivening our physical organism. It is true to say, therefore, that during the night every person first passes through an etheric prelude in cosmic fear and divine yearning, then a planetary stage in which his astral body feels after images of the planetary movements, and then an experience of the fixed stars during which he feels or would do if he was conscious that his own inner soul and spirit are a replica of the starry heavens. Someone who understands these stages of sleep will find that a significant question arises for him each night. The human soul, the astral organism, the capital I being, detach themselves from the physical body, and their inner life is filled by a replica of the planetary movements and the configurations of fixed stars. And the question is this, why do we return to physical existence again every morning after sleep? In fact, it becomes evident to initiation science that we would not do so if, as we enter the planetary movements and fixed star forms, we did not also find our way into the moon forces as we grow out into the replicas of cosmic existence. We enter into the spiritual moon forces, those powers of the cosmos reflected in the physical moon and its fluctuation, fluctuations. Whereas all other planetary and fixed star powers really draw us out of our physical body, the moon forces bring us back time and again into our physical body. The moon is connected, generally, with everything that brings us down from spiritual existence into physical existence. The moon is always present in the spiritual world, and the physical constellation plays no part here, whether it is new moon, full moon, or waning moon, although this does have a certain significance. Moon forces are always there and guide the human being back into the physical world, into his physical body. You see, the description, albeit only schematic, of what we pass through between falling asleep and waking up again is a picture of our sojourn in the world of spirit altogether. Each night, basically, we experience a reflection of what we pass through between death and a new birth. If we use the faculties of imagination, inspiration and intuition to look back into our pre-earthly existence, then we first glimpse ourselves as human spirit-soul being at a very early stage of this existence. There, 
we see ourselves possessing cosmic consciousness, no longer dwelling in a life that carries in it mere replicas of the cosmos, as in sleep, but instead actually poured out through the real cosmos. And roughly around the middle of life, between death and a new birth, we feel ourselves fully conscious as spirit soul beings, with a much clearer and more intense awareness than we can have on earth, and surrounded by divine spiritual beings, by the divine spiritual hierarchies. In the same way that we work with natural forces here on earth, so work unfolds between us and the beings of the higher spiritual hierarchies. What is the nature of this work? In union with a huge number of sublime spiritual beings in the universe, our being of soul and spirit weaves the cosmic spirit germ of our future physical body. However strange this may sound to you, the very greatest most significant work that can be conceived of is to weave the spirit germ of the human physical body out of the cosmos. The human soul und undertakes this in the condition I have described in collaboration with hosts of divine spiritual beings. If you picture the most complex thing that can be created here on earth, this is primitive and simple compared to the mighty weft of cosmic grandeur and glory that is created there, later to be reduced and compressed through conception and birth, filled with earthly matter to become a physical body. If we speak of a seed here on earth, this is a small germ that later grows relatively large. But in speaking of the human body as an outcome of spirit, of a spiritual seed, this seed is of huge dimensions. As we move on from the time I have described toward our next birth, this human germ of soul-spiritual grandeur increasingly shrinks, and we work further on it, elaborate it with a view to weaving, reducing, and condensing it into the physical human body. It is really with good reason that the initiates of older eras spoke of the human body as a, quote, temple of the gods, close quote, although clairo oh, excuse me, through clairvoyance we no longer possess, though initiation science teaches the same thing. Let me read that again. It is really with good reason that the initiates of older eras spoke of the human being as a temple of the gods. Through clairvoyance we no longer possess, though initiation science teaches the same thing. It is indeed a temple, woven each time anew out of the universe by the human soul in union with divine beings between death and a new birth. And then we are endowed with our physical form in a way that I will describe. In weaving the spirit germ of our physical body at the indicated stage of our sojourn in worlds of spirit, we are in a state of soul, a soul mood, that can only be compared with what a modern initiate calls intuition. Our soul lives amidst the deeds of gods, flowing out entirely into the gods' divine existence. In this middle stage, between death and a new birth, it experiences the life of divine beings, shares in this life. But as we progress further, moving toward conception and birth, this alters, in a sense, we become aware that the divine beings of the higher hierarchies withdraw from us, and then what we receive is more like a manifestation, a reflection of glory, as if the gods have withdrawn and only their mistier reflections still stood before us, as if a kind of veil has been woven as misty replica of what was previously there as reality. The intuition consciousness we possessed before now passes into cosmic inspiration consciousness. We no longer live with the divine spiritual beings, but with their revelation. But at the same time, instead, an inward I, in capital I, increasingly develops in our soul consciousness. At what I would call the high point of our life, between death and a new birth, we live entirely with beings of soul and spirit of the higher hierarchies and 
Our I capital has no inner strength. It only starts to become aware of itself again as the gods withdraw, leaving only their manifestation. The glory or radiance of the gods enters us now in a kind of inspiration consciousness. This loss in immediate reality is balanced by our sense of ourselves as an autonomous being. And what awakens in us initially here is something I would call a desire, a strong wish. At the midpoint between death and a new birth, we work on the spirit germ of our physical body out of a deep inner fulfillment. Though we anticipate the goal of our new physical body in our next life, this is not pervaded by desire, but only, if you like, by wonder at the nature of this physical human form in universal terms. The moment we no longer dwell in divine worlds themselves, but in the revelation or manifestation of these worlds, desire awakens in us to be re-embodied on earth. As our I, capital consciousness, becomes ever stronger, this desire awakens to be incarnated again on earth. We distance ourselves from divine worlds and start to approach what we will subsequently become as earthly human beings. This desire grows ever stronger, and what we perceive outside us also changes. Previously we dwelt entirely amongst beings in the divine spiritual hierarchies, and knew ourselves to be one with them. The cosmos was our interior life. But this cosmos itself consisted of beings at lofty levels of consciousness with whom we lived. Now instead, we see external appearance within which gradually emerge the first pictures of divine spiritual beings as physical reflections. From the sun being we encountered in further realms, there emanates a shimmer within which the sun now appears, as seen externally from the world. Here on earth we look up toward the sun. As we descend before birth, we first see the sun from the other side. But the sun and the fixed stars dawn for us, and behind them the planetary movements. And as these planetary movements surface, quite specific forces emerge too, the spiritual moon forces which now take possession of us and gradually bear us back into earthly life. This is in fact the view we have as we descend from cosmic worlds to earthly existence. We pass from an experience of divine spiritual hierarchies to pictures of them, but these images of their being gradually become star constellations, which we enter as if from behind initially. We enter into what appears to us on earth as the cosmos. Modern initiation science can to a large degree penetrate with understanding the details of what a human soul accomplishes here. Only by concerning ourselves with the specific details of these things do we come to a fuller understanding of life. You see, no one really grasps life if he sees the human being only in terms of earth existence. He won't be able to make much of life in this case. In the huge spans of time between death and a new birth, the earth is of no importance to us, to begin with, and the external light that shines upon us here is there transformed into whole worlds of the divine, in which we then dwell, and which only reveal their outer aspect to us again as stars when we approach the earth again to embark on a new life on earth. What we first weave as the spirit germ of our physical body, we know initially to be one with the whole spiritual universe. But as we come to see only the reflected manifestation of the divine spiritual world, this spirit germ increasingly becomes our body, which is now also a reflection of the cosmos. 
and from this body of ours arises the desire for an earthly existence for capital I consciousness in our body. This body is still a spirit body as yet, and therefore much about it is still untouched by earthly existence. At a certain stage, for instance, no decision has as yet been made as to whether the person concerned will be a man or a woman in their next life. You see, there is no sense at all in considering this distinction during much of the period between death and a new birth. Not until a very late stage in the process of approaching earthly birth does this question become meaningful. The soul is dwelling in quite different conditions than those in which man and woman come to expression on earth. There are conditions that unfold in spiritual existence and are reflected in earthly realities. But what appears as male and female gender on earth only acquires meaning at a relatively late stage before one descends to earth again. And we can trace the specifics of how if certain former karmic conditions suggest to the soul that it will be best undergoing the forthcoming life as a woman, the human being descends toward earthly existence and connecting with the human physical germ chooses the time which on earth we perceive as that of full moon. If we look up at the full moon from any region of the earth, this is the time during which beings descending to earth choose to become women. Only then is this decision made. And those who wish to become men choose the time of new moon. In other words, we enter into earthly existence through the gateway of the moon. But the strength the man needs to embark on earthly life shines out into the universe at that time and he comes toward it as he enters from the universe. It streams out from the moon at the time of new moon on the earth. The strength the woman needs, by contrast, shines out from the moon at the time of full moon. Then its illumined face is turned toward the earth and its dark aspect sends out into the universe the strength the human entelechy needs if it is to become a woman. What I have described to you will show you that ancient astrology was well founded even if it has become entirely decadent today in its prevalent forms. It is only a question of perceiving things inwardly and seeing interrelationships. It is not enough merely to calculate the position of a physical constellation, but we also have to grasp the spirit corresponding to this. It really is possible to enter into specific details here. At a certain stage we descend again from the cosmos, passing from the spiritual cosmos into the etheric cosmos. At the moment I am still speaking only of the etheric cosmos. The physical stars play a lesser role here, and the physical moon is still less significant. The key moment, when a person chooses to descend to earth, is connected, as I have said, with the phase of the moon, with moon conditions. But as the soul descends, it is frequently exposed to the full moon or new moon and therefore after the decisive new moon or full moon influence, when a soul has decided to become male or female, since this descent occurs only gradually, the soul choosing to become a man can still decide to expose itself to the full moon influence. In other words, the soul has decided to become a man and has used the new moon forces for this, but in descending can still draw upon the moon's further phases. The soul is then filled with moon forces in a way that no longer affects gender, but chiefly the head organization instead, all that originates in the cosmos and is externally connected with the head organization, when the particular constellation occurs as I have described. And so, if the human soul has decided to become a man through the influence of the new moon period, and then continues to dwell in the cosmos and is exposed to the following full moon period, 
the influences of these moon forces will, for instance, give him brown eyes and black hair. The way the human soul passes the moon not only determines gender but also the color of hair and eyes. If someone, say, has passed the full moon as a woman and is subsequently exposed to the influences of the new moon, this can endow her with blue eyes and fair hair. This may sound grotesque, but certainly how we experience the cosmos predestines the way in which our soul and spirit work into our physical and etheric organism. Whether we have black hair or blonde is not determined before this point, but is decided by moon forces as we descend from the cosmos and pass the moon. In the same way that we pass the moon, which really guides us into earthly existence, so we also pass the other planets. It is not an indifferent matter whether we pass Saturn in one way or another. For example, we may pass Saturn at a time when, due to a particular constellation, the power of Saturn works together with that of the constellation Leo. Because Saturn is here strengthened by Leo in the zodiac, as we pass this region, although our previous karma determines this, we acquire the strength that enables us to meet external events in life with prudence, so that they do not always disconcert us. If Saturn is, say, more subject to the influence of Capricorn, then we become weaker people who can collapse under the pressure of circumstances. We bear all this within us as, entering from the cosmos, we prepare our life on earth. Naturally, education can overcome such weaknesses, but not by saying, along with materialists, that all this is nonsense and there is no need to consider it, not in that way, but by developing the powers intrinsic to us, really developing them. And in future humanity will learn once more not merely to ensure that a child receives good milk and good sustenance, but to perceive also whether Saturn forces or Jupiter forces are at work in someone under a particular influence. Let us say that in a particular case, a person's karma means that he bears Saturn forces within him under the most unfavorable influence, for instance, under the influence of Capricorn or Aquarius, and he is therefore exposed to all life's greatest difficulties then we can carefully seek for other powers within him and try to strengthen these. We might ask, for instance, whether he passed through the Jupiter sphere, the Mars sphere, or through some other sphere. And it will always be possible to set one thing against the other to supply a remedy. We will have to learn to think of human beings not just in terms of diet and earthly concerns, but in connection with their passage through cosmic worlds between death and a new birth. As a human soul draws close to his earthly life, in a sense he loses some of his intrinsic being. As you saw from my description, he has been connected with the spirit germ of the physical body he has been weaving. He has also interwoven this spirit germ with his experiences of descending through the fixed stars and the planets. At a certain stage, very close to conception and birth, the spirit germ is no longer present, but has in the meantime descended to the earth, taking its powers down with it as energy system. It has lapsed from us, and independently merged with inherited physical substance passed on through ancestors, and the future child's mother and father. What is woven into the organism precedes us to the earth, ahead of our intrinsic being of soul and spirit. And when a soul feels that he has passed to his parents what he himself really wove in the cosmos, he is able at this last stage before earthly life begins since he no longer needs to weave his physical body, which is largely ready and has been given up to the stream of inheritance and incorporated into it 
to draw what he needs as ether organism from the world ether and mantle himself in it. He draws his etheric organism together. And along with this etheric organism, he now connects with what he himself has prepared through his parents. He takes on his physical body, into which this whole cosmic weft of the spirit germ has contracted, inscribed with what the person himself experienced as, in descending, he passed through this or that region of the stars. He does not arbitrarily pass through the gate of new moon or full moon or randomly become a man or woman with black or blonde hair or blue or brown eyes. But all this is intimately connected with the outcomes of his former karma. You can see from all this that whereas in sleep we only pass through replicas of the planetary world, of the world of fixed stars, between death and a new birth we traverse these worlds in reality. As we pass through them they become our inner life. The moon forces are always what bring us back to the earth and as such they are different from all other star powers. In sleep they return us to the earth and likewise they return us to the earth after we have traversed all the regions I described and approach a new life on earth. But now let us consider once again the astral and capital I organization that are outside the physical body when we sleep. Rather than a fabric of physical bones and physical blood, our whole moral worth is interwoven with our spirit and soul. Here on earth we are composed of bones, blood and nerves. But what rises out of us as we fall asleep and enters us again when we wake up is composed of a reality that has coalesced from judgments about our own moral actions. If I did a good deed during the day, the effect of this is inscribed into my spirit-soul sleep body that rises out of me at night. My moral quality dwells in it. And when we pass through the gate of death, we bear with us the whole realized estimation of our moral being. You see, we create a second human being within us, in fact, in our life on earth between birth and death. This second human being who emerges from us every night during sleep is the outcome of our moral or immoral life, and this passes with, with us through the gate of death. This outcome incorporated into the eternal core of our being is not the only thing we possess in our soul and spirit as it rises out of us at night. But particularly after death, when we dwell first in the etheric body and then in the astral body, we discern almost nothing other than this moral entelechy of ours. We can then perceive clearly whether we did good or ill, we are this. Just as we are a person with skin, nerves, blood or bones on earth, there we perceive ourselves in terms of our morality or immorality. And now after death we make our way outward, first through the moon sphere, then through the fixed star sphere, until we arrive at the time when we can begin to work with the beings of the higher hierarchies upon the spirit germ of our future physical body. But if we bore this moral element right up into the highest worlds, where we must weave the spirit germ of our future physical organism, the latter would become a real monstrosity. For a period between death and a new birth, we must be lifted beyond our moral quality. In fact, we leave it behind in the moon sphere. You see, as we pass beyond the moon sphere, we leave behind there our moral or immoral aspect and enter into the pure sphere of the gods where we can weave our new physical body. But now, once again, I have to highlight the difference between older eras before the mystery of Golgotha and those following it, through to modern times. 
ancient initiates told their pupils, who passed this on to all humankind, that to find a transition from the world I described as the world of souls in my book titled Theosophy, which we pass through entirely, really in the moon sphere, to make this transition and gain entry to what I called spirit land, we must acquire feelings on earth which allow the spiritual sun beings to guide us upward after we have left this whole baggage of moral effects behind us in the moon sphere. Everything that history tells us about the first three Christian centuries, about the fourth century A.D. too, is really false. Christianity was quite different from how it is described during these centuries. It was different because a view prevailed during this time, which still originated in an understanding of ancient initiation. This initiation wisdom gave people the knowledge that the great sublime sun being led by the human soul, excuse me, let me read that again, this initiation wisdom gave people the knowledge that the great sublime sun being led the human soul, once it had left its moral baggage behind it, out of the moon's sphere after death, and then led the soul back again as it returned to the moon sphere. This was known to endow people with the strength, which they could not acquire by themselves, to incorporate this moral aspect at a certain period before birth, so that in their souls they could fulfill their destiny on earth. This moral quality was not to enter the body, for otherwise a person would be deformed at birth and suffer great physical disease or disorder. It has instead to be taken on again by the soul as we enter the moon sphere so that it does not enter our future body. The initiates, living at the time of the mystery of Golgotha and three to four centuries afterward too, told their pupils that the lofty aim, excuse me, that the lofty sun being used only to dwell above in worlds of spirit. But as humanity progressed, I, capital consciousness, became so bright on earth that it became correspondingly darkened or obscured in the world of spirit. You see, the brighter our I consciousness is here on earth, by virtue of the physical body alone, the darker it is up above. If Christ had not descended and undergone the mystery of Golgotha, human beings could no longer have approached the sun being or, by their own strength, found the transition from the moon sphere into higher spheres. The being whom we used to encounter after death, only in the spiritual world, descended, and since the mystery of Golgotha lives here upon earth, we can gain a relationship to him by holding to the Pauline saying, quote, Not I, but Christ in me. Close quote. By this means we take with us from this earth the strength given us by Christ here on earth to leave behind our moral being, which we ourselves individually engender, in the moon sphere, and to pass on into the higher spheres to weave the spirit germ of our future physical body. And this means in turn that we find the strength as we descend again through the moon sphere to take our karma upon us by our free choice, to shoulder the consequences of our good and bad deeds. During the course of evolution we have become free human beings, but this is only because the power of Christ, which we acquire here on earth, enables us to take on our karma by our own free strength as we descend to the moon sphere. Quite irrespective of whether this thought pleases or displeases us while on earth, at this stage of life between death and a new birth, we do this if we become true Christians. I have tried to describe some of what modern initiation science can perceive of the worlds we may call the hidden aspects of human existence, and really human nature can only be explained by considering these hidden aspects. At the same time, I sought to show you the related importance of the Christ impulse for modern human beings, for this is something we must keep coming back to. 
We cannot be full human beings in the time after the mystery of Golgotha if we do not find our way to the Christ impulse. And therefore anthroposophic spiritual science has to increasingly illumine the Christ impulse in the right way. The obscured way in which Christianity was seen in the past with dulled consciousness would deprive most of humanity of the opportunity to embrace Christianity. Think of people in the Orient and the inhabitants of other regions of the earth. But a Christianity deepened by anthroposophic insights is something which, if the living core of it is understood in the way I intended here, will be embraced by people in the East particularly, who possess an ancient, albeit now decadent, spirituality, embraced by them with full hearts. Only in this way can peace come to the earth. It must arise from the human soul and spirit. Every open-minded person knows at heart how important peace is to the earth. People will increasingly come to see how worthless is all superficial tinkering with outward forms and institutions, and how important it is by contrast to address souls directly. But we cannot address them if we have nothing to tell them about the soul's true home and about what we experience beyond physical existence in states of consciousness I have described today. While these states of awareness may not be present during earthly life, their effects and consequences exist. Oh, anyone who understands life will see in every human face an image of the cosmic destinies a person has passed through between death and a new birth. I described to you today how the destiny of being either a man or a woman can be understood through insight into the cosmos how even the color of our eyes or hair can only be understood if we can perceive cosmic existence. Nothing is comprehensible in this world if we do not see it in connection with the cosmos. People will only feel their full humanity if we draw on real spiritual insight to show them their deep connection with all that underlies physical sense existence. Even if people are unaware of this today, Unconsciously they thirst for such insight, and the convulsions we are experiencing in all areas of life, in our culture, in the field of human rights, in economic life, all of this can ultimately be traced back to the Spirit, and all of it can only be lifted out of decline and rejuvenated if people learn again to understand something of their connection with an existence beyond the physical world. This physical existence is nothing if it is not seen in connection with a life beyond physical reality. Our physical human body only acquires its meaning if we see it as the confluence of all the majestic powers that are woven into it between death and a new birth. The tragedy of the materialistic worldview is that ultimately it does not even understand material reality. We place the human corpse on the dissecting table and conscientiously study its tissues and various physical attributes. We do so because we wish to understand matter, but we do not come to know it by these means, for it is an outcome of the spirit. We only come to know it if we can trace it back to the realms where it is woven from the spirit. Physical and material existence itself will only become comprehensible to people when their soul is guided toward cosmic realities of soul and spirit. If we fill ourselves with an awareness that we need to increasingly understand how we are connected with the spirit and soul of the cosmos, we become true anthroposophists. Here, at least, I will not be ridiculed, I'm sure. If I say that the world needs true anthroposophists who further humanity's ascent with a form of awareness that arises when we experience the spirit, even if, to begin with, we only grasp it as an image or a reflection and do not ourselves perceive it clairvoyantly. 
We do not need to be clairvoyant ourselves to possess knowledge of the Spirit and work charitably and beneficially. When we eat meat, we do not have to know exactly what constitutes it. It will still nourish us. In the same way, we do not need to be clairvoyant to bring about, through the way we work, our whole connection with the life of higher worlds. Assuming the spirit exists before we become clairvoyant is like consuming spirit. Clairvoyance does not really add anything to what we can become through a spiritual knowledge of the world. It only satisfies our need for knowledge, which we inevitably have. Of course, there must be people who study the precise composition of meat, but we do not have to stop eating until we know this. Likewise, we need people with clairvoyance nowadays to study how human beings are connected with the world of spirit. But for humanity to work in the right way, we need only be healthy human souls who will sense their power of soul digestion when they hear someone speaking of the science of the spirit. They will absorb this spiritual element, assimilate it, and incorporate it into their work. And this is what we need today throughout the civilized world, outward human work which is rightly and truly filled with spirit.